All right, welcome back to part four. Uh, picking up, we're on resuscitation here. So as I said before, there's two different protocols. One's gonna be for age eight and older, and one is gonna be for under eight, okay? So looking at this one, uh, eight and older, typically your adults here, talks about CCR. Now CPR is all gonna be the same, uh, 100 to 120 a minute. We're looking for good depth, uh, two to 2.4 inches, good recoil, all that's the same. Uh, remember, we don't have to innovate patients. We can go straight to a superglottic if you feel that's appropriate and fast. Couple things, if your cardiac arrest is witnessed um, or you show up in a reasonable amount of time and there's adequate bystander CPR going on, it's recommended that we get the pads on them and we potentially defibrillate them immediately. The concept is if it's witnessed, then they were just perfusing a second ago and now they're not. So we can quickly fix their erratic rhythm um, and they have enough oxygen within that blood. And if we show up, if they've been doing good compressions, we know that they've been circulating that oxygenated blood, so we can go ahead and defibrillate. Now, if it took us a long response time, unknown downtime, uh, or you show up and the compressions look like garbage or nobody's doing CPR, then before we wanna defibrillate them, you probably wanna do about 200 compressions first, just to prime the pump, get blood circulated, and then we'll light them up, okay? Remember, as we talked, there's only three epi doses now in cardiac arrests. That's it, just three. Um, for adults, we're still going to give the one milligram. For kids, you can do 0 .01 milligrams per kilogram or 0 0.1 cc's per kilo, however you want to remember that. For amiodarone, it's going to be five milligrams per kilogram up to a max of 300. We're so used to just 300 right off the bat with adults. Remember, it's supposed to be five per kilo. And then of course our repeat bolus is gonna be half that, so up to 150 milligrams for adults. Lidocaine, one to 1.5 per kilo, um, if that was your only option. And then mag sulfate for those torsades patients, uh, we're gonna give two grams IV IO bolus. Just make it kind of a slow bolus, we don't wanna slam it in there. Hyperkalemia is gonna pop up again in your cardiac arrest scenarios, that is a potential. Uh, remember, we don't have calcium gluconate, so we will be giving calcium chloride at one gram IV IO over five minutes, uh, not to exceed one milliliter per minute. So again, 50 cc bag, run it in really slow, okay, an infusion. Uh, I apologize for it being sideways here. This is your CCR protocol. Nothing's really changed except for, uh, remember, only three epis. Still are gonna give four rounds of compressions but only three epis within that, okay? Here's your cardiac arrest for less than eight years old. We're gonna be giving compressions 30 to two if you're by yourself, or CPR ratios of 15 to two if you have two rescuers. So for the most part, we're always working in teams. You're gonna do 15 to two. Now for CCR, remember who CCR is absolutely indicated for, who it was created for. It's gonna be cardiac related arrests. If you truly believe that it was a cardiac event, then do CCR. If it's anything but that, you're not doing CCR. That also includes if it took you well over five minutes to get on scene. If this patient's been down for 10, 15, 20 minutes in some of our responses, then that oxygen's already depleted, right? So we need to just go right back to our normal uh, ACLS type standards of 30 to two. Uh, you can go ahead and get them ventilated, intubated, uh, and get them oxygenated as soon as possible. Okay. <clears throat> For kids, when we go to defibrillate, we're going to do two joules per kilo. Next one's going to be four joules per kilo. And it says that we can work our way up to a max of 10 joules per kilo. Now, nothing says how exactly you get there. Do you go two, four, 10, two, four, 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 10, two, four, six, eight, 10? Who knows? Um, what I would recommend, if you've got a kid who's still uh, in cardiac arrest after you know that second defibrillation, now you're looking at a third, go to 10. Just go two, four, 10. That would be my recommendation. Remember, epinephrine's gonna be uh, using that one to 10,000 in codes. And for kids, it'll be 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, or you can remember 0 0.1 cc's per kilo for the kids. 
Uh, mag sulfate for torsades, they are recommending 25 to 50 milligrams per kilogram IVIO. Looking at hyperkalemia, again, it pops up here. Uh, for kids, calcium chloride is going to be 20 milligrams per kilogram or 0.2 cc's per kilo. Um, let's see. For ROSC, same, same. We're going to get blood pressures, give them fluid boluses, check sugar, get a 12 lead, um, and just manage their airway appropriately. Manage end titles, look at their vitals. For obvious and apparent death, a few changes on this one. Right here, notice that it excludes drownings and lightning strikes. So any of those patients, you're going to work them all the way to the hospital. Okay. Now there's two types of arrests here um, that we're going to pretty much terminate. Ones that require for you to get a strip and ones that do not require the monitor to get a strip on. Okay. So when a monitor is not required, those are your patients who are decapitated. They're obviously not going to live. Uh, they're decomposing, they're transected, meaning they're ripped in half and their bowels are everywhere. If they're incinerated, basically 90% plus burns all over their body, those patients are not going to come back. They're dead. Uh, no monitor required. Although, if you have a patient with lividity, rigor, or any other major injuries, like a gunshot wound to the head, and you're showing obvious brain matter, those patients, although we can still call and terminate efforts, we're going to have to at least get a strip on them. Two leads, of course, to confirm it. We talked about our do not resuscitate, but again, a quick recap. If there is no DNR present, um, but they say they have one, don't touch the patient for two minutes. Go help the family find that DNR first. If you can't find it in two minutes, then we go back to doing our BLS, CPR, and then eventually into our ALS stuff, okay? But no CPR for the first two minutes if we're trying to look for the DNR. And if somebody says they have power of attorney, then they must provide that documentation that states that they have it. And again, it must be signed by the patient, signed by them and witnessed, and uh, just make sure it's absolutely legitimate. Of course, you might wanna call a doctor regardless and just make sure they buy off on it, okay? So termination of resuscitative efforts. You have to meet all those criteria. If it was an unwitnessed code, there's no shock advised on an AED or you're not seeing a shockable rhythm on the monitor and there's been no ROSC um, and you've done four rounds of CCR or your CPR, you've given your three EPIs, then you can go ahead and call for termination. Now some other criteria here, if you have a narrow complex PEA with a rate greater than 40 or refractory VFib, VTAC, meaning they're not responsive to your defibrillator, consider resuscitating for up to 60 minutes uh, from the time of dispatch. And then if there's no return after that, we can go ahead and probably call it. Now keep in mind, I don't really see many situations where we're gonna be working a code for 60 minutes on scene before we transport. So ideally you should be long on your way to the hospital by this point and you're probably just going to work it all the way in and let them call it and that way that body's not stuck in your ambo. Uh, some other criteria, uh, if you have greater than 30 minute downtime, pulses for more than 60 seconds, non-shockable rhythm, PEA, asystole, or you have that witness to rest, 20 minutes of resuscitation with PEA and end titles are less than 10 with a non-shockable rhythm we can call and terminate, okay? I'm glad they put this in here, those end titles. Remember, for checking quality of your CPR, you gotta maintain end titles greater than 10. Typically, if you see an end title less than 10, you gotta look at your compressor. He's probably in the wrong spot, wrong depth, wrong rate, he's getting fatigued. That's usually the number one issue is he's fatigued. So we gotta swap him out. Remember, every two minutes, swap your compressors. And I promise you, when you get a fresh set of arms on that chest, it's gonna spike the end titles usually pretty well. Um, usually, if somebody can be maintained in, with CO2s in like the high teens, low 20s, you probably have a really good chance of getting ROSC on that patient. Uh, however, if those end titles are less than 10 for a, a long period of time, there's no hope, that patient's gone. There are some pediatric only guidelines. There are, everything that we've looked at up to this point 
has been a mix of adult and peds all together, but there's some specific pediatric ones here, like this one being those uh, bronchospasms, or they call it bronchiolitis, less than two years old. So less than two years old, sounds kind of like an asthma patient, but it's not called asthma. And we're gonna give them Epi SVN three milligrams with three milliliters of saline in the nebulizer. Now, if that uh, pediatric is showing signs of croup or epiglottitis, we're still gonna give Epi SVN, but they're gonna ramp up the dose of it to five milligrams, along with their three cc's of normal saline. And you can also try to give dexamethasone, we're not gonna carry it, uh, so you may want to patch and ask if you can give solimedrol. Kind of a little note here for kids, we don't necessarily have to have IVs on them. Just because you don't have an IV doesn't mean your patient can't be classified as ALS. We're still assessing them properly. We got them on the monitor. You always have the IO readily available if you really need it, right? Um, remember, IVs are for drugs and for fluids. If you are not gonna give them fluids and you are not gonna give them any medications, then why are you starting an IV, okay? There are complications involved with IVs. So starting an IV just in case doesn't really fly, okay? Just in case that patient suddenly codes immediately on you, then again, you have an IO readily available and you can get that IV pretty darn quick. For neonatal resuscitative efforts, uh, remember for that birth to one month, we're gonna look at blood sugars. If they're less than 40, we can go ahead and treat with our D10. Remember, we wanna keep our heart rates well over 100. If they're less than 100, positive pressure ventilation, high flow O2. Kids are really responsive to airway. If that heart rate is less than 60, despite ventilatory efforts, then we're gonna go ahead and do um, CPR and compressions. If you're doing rescue breaths on a neonate, remember the rate changes and you need to give breaths at, um, at 40 to 60 breaths per minute, okay? And if you're doing CPR on that neonate, our CPR ratio is different. It'll be three compressions to one breath. You're still gonna be in that 100 to 120 compressions per minute, but I'd probably push closer to that 120 compressions per minute, okay? So one, two, three breath, one, two, three breath, one, two, three breath. Remember with all pediatrics, infants, infants and neonates, uh, the preferred technique is that thumb and circling technique, okay? I mean, you can use your fingers if you need to for compressions, but it is preferred to use your thumb and hands for infants and neonates. Here's a big one. Um, neonates <clears throat> that are premature, they're gonna be very low body weights, right? A full-term baby is typically gonna be at least three to four kilos. Now for endotracheal tube selection, a bad habit that we have in EMS is when you have a little teeny tiny patient, we think they need a little teeny tiny tube. Not necessarily the case, okay? If you have, uh, well according to here, greater than two kilos or more than 34 week gestation, they need an, end title or a, an endotracheal tube of 3.5 or maybe a four if they're a full term baby, but typically a 3.5. Uh, don't fall in that trap where that small little baby has to have a 2.5 tube. That's probably way too small for them, okay? Remember your tube placement for pediatrics, okay? It's gonna be 16 plus the age, divide all that by four, okay? Uh, so let's say you had a four-year-old, 16 plus four is 20, divided by four is gonna be five. So you need an, an ET tube five. With your epinephrine, we're gonna be using that one to 10,000, just the same, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Here's your algorithm in box form, step by step. With OBGYN, nothing's really changed in here except for those um, mag infusions for preeclampsia and eclampsia. So here, preeclamptic patients, look for all the signs. Remember, uh, hypertension. So if you don't know what their normal pressure is, go with 140 over 90. Uh, whereas if you have that mom who's been tracking her blood pressure, if they've had a significant jump, then that would be a problem. Blurred vision, dizziness, that uh, sensitivity to light and sound, excessive swelling, especially in the pedal area. Those are all signs of preeclampsia. And we know preeclampsia is basically leading up to eclampsia when they start seizing. 
So hopefully we can prevent that if we get our mag sulfate on board quick enough. Uh, four grams IV over 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, probably put that into like a 50 cc bag and then run your infusion formula. They got a list of perinatal facilities. Remember with traumas, we go to level ones. With the OBs, we're looking for level threes. Um, kind of the opposite concept is trauma here. So for us being on the west side, we're looking at Thunderbird, uh, Good Sam, or Banner University Phoenix. Here's another list of what kind of facilities can tolerate what gestational age of a baby or what kind of complications. Getting into our trauma. Remember when we're assessing and managing our trauma patients, we wanna make sure that we're having fairly decent blood pressures. Now they say maintain over 90 systolic and that's always been our rule of thumb, okay? But I, I think what we should do more appropriately is just be assessing for those distal pulses. Look at the radials, look at the pedals. As long as we have distal perfusion, we know the blood pressure is good enough, right? Even if their systolic blood pressure comes back in the high 70s, low 80s, yeah, that seems pretty low, but as long as they're pushing pulses and we have some cap refill um, that's appropriate, that's probably okay. There's this concept in trauma centers um, called permissive hypotension. Now, we never intentionally drop somebody's blood pressure, but you may choose not to intentionally raise their pressure significantly, okay? Um, remember when somebody's bleeding internally, they're trying to clot and trying to fix that wound. So if we start flowing all sorts of fluids into them, we're gonna really jack up that blood pressure and we're just gonna start flushing all these clotting factors away and they're not gonna be able to clot adequately. So keeping them out of blood pressure, 90, 100, that's probably fine for them as long as they're pushing pulses, right? We don't really wanna give so much fluid and get them to 140, 150 systolic. That's not gonna be good for them. Now, here's some criteria for triaging. We all know some hospitals use like an ABC uh, triage type category. Um, and I know that we've all had some really bad horror stories of transporting patients that we believed were true level ones. They were messed up, altered, all the signs of trauma, uh, neurological problems, only to get to the hospital and have them shove us in a back room somewhere in the ER and not get trauma services, okay? Reason being is they're following this chart, whoever's taking the patch, and they're not really seeing what you're trying to describe to them. All they're doing is following criteria, okay? So, big ones in here is gonna be fall injuries. If you have an adult that falls more than 20 feet or a kid greater than 10 feet, uh, that would classify them as a level one. Uh, if you have a 962 and they have intrusion, greater than 12 inches on the roof, like a rollover, or more than 18 inches on the side coming into the patient compartment. Let's say your patient fell 15 feet but landed flat on their head, they're unconscious, they're altered, unequal pupils, repetitive questions. I mean, that sounds like a true level one type of a patient, okay? So what I would recommend during your phone call, just so there's no problems when you get there, guess how high, guess how high they fell? 20 plus feet is what I would say. Don't tell them 15 feet, because they're gonna probably downgrade them to a B or a C or something, okay? Um, you might wanna stretch it a little bit to fit that criteria so you know that your patient will get the proper treatment, okay? Now here's another thing that's been added. Uh, basically, if you have a traumatic code with thoracic trauma, you should be dropping needles on them bilaterally. Okay, so needle thoracostomy, one on each side of the chest, right away, uh, let's rule out. Think about the things that will kill a trauma patient with thoracic trauma. Tension pneumos, hemos, pericardial tamponade, aortic rupture, okay? We can treat two of those things with chest needles. Remember, we can go second or third intercostal space on the anterior, or we can go third or fourth space on the lateral space, or lateral aspect, okay? Uh, so bilateral chest needles, rule it out. You know as soon as they get to the trauma center, what are they gonna do? Bilateral chest tubes, just to rule it out. So it's better for you to do it sooner than later. Uh, it's amazing 
what your heart will be able to do if we relieve the pressure, okay? Unfortunately, when we have trauma codes, a lot of times we get so focused on the cardiac side of it, compressions, airway, IVs, epi, right? Um, we forget to think about those five H's, five T's. The biggest one being tension pneumos and hemos. Let's relieve the pressure, okay? All right, burn patients, nothing big. Remember, lots of fluid boluses for them. Think about the three things that kill burn patients, uh, infection, hypotension, and hypothermia. So make sure that we're keeping them warm, we're getting in lots of fluids, uh, and try to use as much sterile type equipment as possible, okay, bandages. As far as critical criteria for burns or what would be classified as critical, uh, I think it used to say five to 10% total body surface area. Now it's saying greater than or equal to 10%. Of course, if they have pre-existing conditions like CHF, uh, COPD, those are just gonna be exacerbated when they have burns. So pay attention to those, Get make sure you get a good sample history. There's some good charts on here that tell you rule of nines, the rule of palms, 1%. Or you can actually look at the age of your patient, look at what's burned, and it'll give you a percentage. So it is important to try to calculate or guesstimate and then give that report in your phone call to the burn center. And of course, I'd, I'd rather you um, guesstimate high than too low. When we have external hemorrhaging, always apply pressure. Tourniquet goes on next. Remember to put tourniquets as high up in our extremity as possible. So way up in the arm, way up in the femoral area because we want to shut down that artery completely. With extremity trauma, uh, if we get into a crush injury type of scenario, uh, we can go ahead and treat that. Now there's no time frame on this. So personally, if someone's been crushed, let's say a significant injury like at their pelvis down or an entire leg or a whole arm, Usually if they're pinned for more than an hour or two, I would be extremely concerned for crush. We know that as soon as we lift that object, we're now gonna have a bunch of uh, dead or dying type blood that's now gonna be put into central circulation. So it's gonna have a bunch of toxins and acids and everything built up in there and clots. So we want to be proactive on this. Before we remove that object, remember large bore IVs, give them some fluid bolus, um, and then start considering sodium bicarb. Okay, we know they're going to be acidotic. We don't want that acid to get all throughout their body and mess them up. So we'll give them that bicarb to kind of buffer it. You can give one milli equivalent per kilo IV IO max of 50. So you could potentially give up to a whole amp on an adult. Make sure that that is very slow. They're saying five minutes. So Again, probably a good idea to flush it in there. Of course, look for changes with their monitor on the 12 lead. You may start seeing signs of hyperkalemia because you have all this excessive potassium starting to float around in your system. Uh, if that's the case, we're gonna have to go give our calcium chloride. Remember, bicarb and calcium do not mix at all. They will start creating this milky, white, gritty type substance in that IV line. So you should get two different IVs and push those drugs through separate lines. If you're only able to get one IV, I would push one. I would flush the heck out of that thing using the push-pull method, like probably 10, 15 times on that 10 cc syringe. Uh, and then you can give that other medication. You'll probably be okay with that. And here again, they got hyperkalemia on the bottom of this protocol for the trauma. Calcium chloride, one gram, IVIO over five minutes for adults. Kids are gonna be 20 milligrams per kilogram. For the EPIC TBI, uh, breathing rates are a little different for them. Infants are gonna be 25 breaths a minute, kids 20 breaths a minute, and adults we wanna do about 10 per minute. Remember the three H-bombs. If you do any one of these things, you are um, like definitely increasing their chance of dying. Uh, you're pretty much signing their death certificate. So hypoxia, hyperventilation, and hypotension. We wanna make sure they're well oxygenated, over 90%. We wanna control our ventilations and do not hyperventilate them because we don't wanna drive CO2s down, which causes vasoconstriction and a lack of perfusion. 
uh, and we don't want their blood pressures to fall. We need their blood pressures to stay up within normal limits so we can perfuse the brain. Okay? Now, if you have a patient with significant hemorrhaging and head trauma, because they're multi-system, well, we talked about like that permissive hypotension. What trumps what? The brain trumps everything. So make sure we have adequate pressures, maybe somewhere between that 110 to 130 systolic range has proven to be pretty good uh, for these TBI patients. Consider intubating. If you can't intubate or it's not gonna be quick enough, you can always drop your supraglottic airway. SMR doesn't appear to have changed. So a lot of this stuff we're gonna start scrolling through real quick here. With any overdoses, uh, make sure that we're gathering all the information, what they took, how much, when, uh, what calculate the body weight for that patient. And you should probably be calling poison control to see how those are gonna interact. If you have a patient that's having extra pyramidal symptoms, we're gonna give our Benadryl for adults 25 milligrams. Uh, for kids, we can give one gram per kilo. When we have the agitated patients, so somebody's extremely combative, we're fighting them, we gotta put them down. Uh, we can use Versed or Ketamine. Again, I highly recommend Ketamine. It's very predictable. It works every time. I've never had it not work. Whereas Versed seems to be kind of questionable. Um, so I personally don't go with it. With ketamine, we can go four milligrams per kilogram intramuscular, intranasally, max of 250 on that route. And then if we have an IV, we can go two milligrams per kilogram IV IO, max of 150, okay? With kids, you should always try to just use restraints to hold a kid down, um, soft restraints, hard restraints, whatever. Uh, I would think that we'd be able to overpower some younger kids. However, if we really need to use uh, medications, then go ahead and do so. And they recommend Versed and Ativan. Okay, Versed 0.1 per kilo uh, and Ativan 0.05 per kilo. With your stimulants, just remember everything's gonna be elevated. So tachycardia, hypertensive, uh, tachypneic, they're probably just gonna be super agitated. Um, so just be calm, try to you know, get them to settle down a bit. With your opioids, we've talked about the Narcan. Remember, we're just giving enough Narcan so they can start breathing well on their own. 0.4 to 2 milligrams, IV, IM, or IN. Uh, down in here, we're getting into the Toxmedic stuff, which I'm going to go ahead and skip through. Here's some carbon monoxide readings here. Keep in mind, um, the life pack monitors do have the ability to check uh, carbon monoxide. Um, we don't carry those ones, but our AMBO provider does, and they've told us that it requires a separate probe. Now, some have told me they don't have it, some said they do have it. I don't know what their official answer is, but I would ask them, if you're thinking somebody has CO poisoning, ask them, hey, do you have the probe to read CO? Let's plug it in. If they don't have it, then our battalion and our hazmat truck do have them. So hopefully if it's a hazmat call, one or both of them should be there anyway. Grab that CO monitor from them. With your organophosphate poisonings, remember dumbbells, sludge them, all those signs and symptoms, okay? Uh, we, could, we can give atropine uh, two to six milligrams IVIO. Of course, it's probably not gonna be enough. Hopefully, um, your hazmat trucks will get there sooner than later, and they've got other meds that are a little better. For any radiation exposure, the biggest concern is gonna be our safety, especially our airway. Um, a lot of times, these particles, if we're handling them too rough, they're gonna kinda get airborne, and we don't wanna inhale these radioactive particles. So uh, when we're trying to decon, we're gonna use like a wet rag or cloth, uh, four by fours, kinda damp and pat them off. Uh, you should have an SCBA on, and then we're probably gonna wrap them up in a blanket and make like a burrito just to contain everything to them. And then make sure that you call the hospital sooner than later, like as soon as you can, call that hospital, give them a heads up, so that way they have time to set up their whole decon procedure. With bites, stings, basically just supportive care, manage any seizures if they have it, uh, fluid boluses, 20 cc's per kilo for adults and kids, get 12 leads, treat for shock if needed with, again, fluids or push-dose presser. With hyperthermia, 
They're wanting us to treat uh, anything over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. We're gonna start that active cooling process. So uh, lots of ice packs all in the groin, behind the neck and the armpits. Uh, you're probably gonna be opening up your saline bottles, cutting open IV bags, just completely soak them down, turn on the AC, try to get them to cool quickly. However, if we're cooling them that quickly, they might start shivering. And when you shiver, I believe your um, oxygen demand goes up like 600%, which is crazy. So we want to stop them from shivering. And to do so, we can give Versed, Ativan, or Valium. So Versed, 2.5 milligrams, IV, IN, or IO. Uh, or we can go 5 milligrams, IM. And we can give Ativan, 1 milligram, IV, IO, or Valium. Of course, kids are going to be a little bit different on their dosing. With drowning, nothing too different there. Just prepare for lots of water to come out of that airway, lots of suctioning, going to be log rolling their head over uh, quite often. Of course, this is not a CCR scenario, so you're not going to do you know the four rounds of 200 compressions. It's straight 30 to 2 by yourself. And then if you have a kid with multiple providers, it'll be 15 to 2 on your ratios. With tasers, we can remove those barbs, okay? As long as they're not in critical areas. If you have barbs stuck in the face, neck, hand, bone, groin, or spinal column, then they're gonna have to be transported to remove those, okay? Or if you go to try to rip them out and they're not budging, then of course we're gonna have to take them in. At any point, you definitely need to get a 12 lead on them. Make sure that there's no cardiac issues going on after the taser event. Uh, assuming that 12 leads normal, they're stable, you can probably leave them, you know, I'm assuming they're still in custody with PD, you can leave them with them. Now, under the appendix, uh, there are some important things in here that we can utilize, like normal uh, vital signs, okay, or abnormal in this case. Uh, if you have a cheat sheet like the Copa card or the Brazo tape, those are great, but if you don't, these are some options too. Okay, just kind of lets you know what a normal would be for that age. Of course, we got our GCS scale. I think fast assessment is in here. Yeah. Pediatric pain scales. Okay, uh, honestly, if we're using the iPad and we're going to pain, you're probably just going to use the the happy frowny face uh, type scale. Here we go. Like I mentioned in our first video, 12 lead indications. Look at all these reasons why you should be doing 12 leads, okay? Numbness, tingling, chest pain, obviously. Any kind of DKA, drug overdose, altered mental status, syncope, palpitations, heart rates too slow, too fast, the ROSC, uh, any kind of metabolic issues, acidosis, shortness of breath, weakness, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, oh, holy smokes. So basically, put people on the monitor, okay? at least a four lead, see what the rhythm is doing. And if there's any odd findings there, throw them on a 12 lead. All right, here are those hyperkalemia indicators. Uh, most of us know when you're hyperkalemic, we get those really peaked T waves. Okay, but notice as our potassium increases and those T's increase, our P wave starts to get really flat. It dampens out, okay? And then as we increase in potassium, now we start widening that QRS and the QT intervals, um, and eventually it's gonna start looking like VTAC, okay? And they pretty much will go into VTAC. Hopefully, we start seeing them somewhere in these earlier phases, so that way, you know, something in this range, so we can really tell what's going on and give us a chance to treat them appropriately, which again would be calcium chloride and albuterol um, in our SVN. Whereas if you show up and they're in VTAC, you're probably gonna be treating the rhythm um, unless you get a really good history as to why they might be hyperkalemic. Most common scenario I could think of is somebody with dialysis, either they've skipped dialysis or something was done wrong at their facility, maybe things weren't mixed appropriately, they come back home and they're feeling ill, okay? Probably the most common for us. Now, uh, this is the fun one. You're treating a patient and all of a sudden a doctor shows up, okay, and starts getting in your way. Um, if that doctor is being super pushy and persistent and wants to get involved, okay, well, are you basically licensed 
and uh, approved to practice in Arizona. You got to confirm that. Uh, they must agree to accompany that patient to the hospital in the ambulance, okay? And you got to get on the phone with your doctor, get medical direction and permission first. So as long as they meet all three of those criteria, then sure, here's the chart, doctor, take on over, okay? Um, but I'm sure at that point, most doctors will go, whoa, you know, they'll probably back up and be on their way. Hopefully they're not interrupting your care. All right, so I think we mentioned this in one of our other videos. Uh, just remember, if we can't get IV access, we're gonna go IO, okay? Don't hesitate. IOs are not as scary as they appear, okay? I know they look and they sound scary, but they're really not any more invasive than a peripheral IV, okay? So don't hesitate. If you know you need to give meds, you know you need to give fluids, and you can't get an IV, um, then go for an IO sooner than later. Always remember to get your airways secured, confirm them, uh, at least in three ways, and title should definitely be one of them, okay? Some criteria here for cardiac arrest. Um, let's see, non-traumatic cardiac arrest. If an airway and IV IO access is obtained and there is return of spontaneous circulation during the resuscitative effort, pediatric patients should be transported to an appropriate hospital with pediatric critical care capability. So. Case in point, too often people have pediatric calls and they just want to get that turd off their plate. They load, they go, and they just dump that patient at the closest hospital. Coming from critical care, that's probably one of the worst things that we could possibly do as EMS providers, okay? Because once that patient gets to that inappropriate facility, they're gonna sit there usually for about two, three plus hours sometimes before they can complete that whole transfer process, okay? Um, so, as long as you have an airway, as long as circulation is restored and you feel like you can manage this patient, go the extra bit of distance and time to get to the right hospital because they'll get there much sooner than trying to be transferred from one facility to another, okay? I know it's going to be a long drive, I know it's going to be scary to most, but it's best for the patient, okay? Another thing along these lines too. A lot of people are so in a rush to transport codes. That's, a, again, if you just load and go on a code, that's probably the worst thing you can do for that patient. You need to stay on scene, assuming it's a safe scenario and nothing crazy is going on, but stay on scene with the code for at least 10 minutes. Do super aggressive, adequate CPR for 10 minutes um, with the appropriate airways and drugs and IVs and all that. Because um, think about it, you have all your crew members, you have all your equipment, you usually have quite enough space, okay? Um, and your, your compressors are on solid ground. They're not rocking around on the back of an AMBO. Because usually, you know, compressors are moving and flying around on the back doing CPR in the AMBO. Uh, you have limited crew members now. Your equipment, a lot of times we'll leave our truck equipment behind and now we're relying on an ambulance to know where their equipment is and you know, God forbid they've already ran several calls, they're depleted of their equipment, they haven't really checked off their ride, uh, maybe their drug box is locked in their compartment, like who knows? There's been so many things that have gone wrong when I've relied on other people. So try to stick with your crew, your gear, and treat that patient. If a patient doesn't come back after 10 minutes, their chances aren't very good anyway, but their best chance of survival is right here, right now, okay? I mean, if you get to the hospital in a couple minutes, Woohoo! What's the hospital going to do that you're not already doing? They're going to do compressions. They're going to breathe for the patient. IVs, epi, okay? That's pretty much the same thing that we're doing. Uh, the most important thing you can do is aggressive compressions right now. Now, if there is no return of spontaneous circulation during resuscitative efforts, the patient should be transported to the closest local hospital emergency department by the most expedient means, okay? So if I don't have an airway, I don't have pulses, then yeah, you are more than justified to transport to the closest emergency room possible, even if it's the freestanding ER, okay? <clears throat> Here's some destination criteria. All the different um, hospitals are listed, stroke centers, trauma centers, 
a whole bunch of them here. Pediatric ICU facilities, cardiac facilities. Here's a list of blood thinners. You know, any elderly patient that falls and hits their head, we always want to ask if they're on blood thinners because we're always concerned that they could have that slow bleed going on. Um, so as we're looking at their meds and their history, here's kind of a reference sheet for you. Some other common meds. Some useful phone numbers. I think at a minimum, everybody should have poison control in their phone programmed, okay? Super easy number to remember there. There's a whole nother sheet for push dose epi. If you forget how to mix it, you can look at this sheet or look at the shock protocol. Under resources here, we talk about restraints and the IO. All right, big changes on the IO. Uh, think about where we can go on adults. We can go proximal or distal tibia and we can go up in the humeral head. Whereas with kids, we're only allowed to use the humerus if they are five or older, okay? Uh, so let's say you have a two-year-old, God forbid they have bilateral tib-fib fractures. You can't go there. You can't go on the shoulder because they're too young. Now we're allowed to go distal femur, okay? So I'd recommend looking at some other YouTube videos. Just type in uh, pediatric distal femur IO. Um, and there's some good, good videos that pop up on that. It's really not a specific landmark that we're looking for. We're just gonna go on the anterior portion of that femur. Think about the lower half of it. Uh, just make sure that we're not getting into the growth plates and we're not obviously in the knee joint, okay? Which is sometimes on chubby little legs, kind of hard to tell. Now, if we have to do a conscious IO, then for adults, we can do 40 milligrams of Lido. Kids are gonna be 0.5 milligrams per kilogram up to that 40 milligrams, okay? Uh, and remember, if you're doing a conscious I.O., it's not like a lot of those other videos you see where people take it like champs and no problems. Usually the conscious patients, I think it's more of a mental issue, like they freak out. It, you know, imagine coming at you with a drill. It's going to be scary, all right? Um, so I think they're more anxious about it rather than it being more painful, um, but expect them to be screaming and cursing at you for sure, okay? But remember, if you need to give them fluid or you need to give them drugs, then of course we need to get it IV access somehow, okay? Big change here, they are recommending the yellow IO now for all adults. Now personally, I think a yellow might be a little excessive in most adult tibias. I think a blue would probably still be fine, but they are recommending a yellow. So if that's what you go with, it's probably gonna stick out a lot farther than what you're used to. Uh, just make sure that we're padding really well around that I.O. so we don't accidentally knock it over. Uh, remember that yellow one is going to be used for patients 40 kilos and over. And then the blue ones are recommended now for 3 to 39 kilos. Notice there's no pink I.O.s on this protocol. Thank God. Uh, the pink I.O.s I think are terrible. On the packaging, they say three to 39 kilos. Well, guess what? Now we can use blues for three to 39 kilos. So often I hear about crews IOing little kids, infants, toddlers with the pink IOs and almost every single time within one, two boluses, that thing pops out and infiltrates, okay? They are not good. Uh, so just go with the blue one. Now, all three IOs, the, the peds, the adult, the large adult one, they're all the same diameter, okay? They're just different lengths. So technically you could drill an infant with a yellow one, it's just gonna really stick out, okay? Which we don't really wanna do that. Uh, so blues and yellows, that's about it. For my agency though, we're not pulling the pink IOs, they're still gonna remain in the box for now, uh, but per protocol, they're not recommended. For the pediatric eye gels, our transport ambulance does have them. So I would highly recommend if you have a peds code or a drowning or something like that where you know you're gonna need an airway, I would try to get on the radio or type a message and say, hey, grab your peds eye gels uh, for the time being. Very soon, I've been told that we are gonna stock and supply our own pediatric eye gels. So we're just waiting on you know, those resources to come in. So that'll be awesome to have those. Don't forget those OG tubes. We talked about that with airway management and innovations. 
as far as sizing on kids, whatever you would calculate a tube size to be, double that and that's your OG NG uh, type. Whereas adults, typically you'll give 10 to 18 French, but usually we want to give the biggest one that we can possibly fit, whether it's the nose or the mouth. Okay? And as far as measuring the length, uh, typically uh, they're saying go between the belly button and the xiphoid, go halfway between that, and then you're going to come up around the ear and then either to the nose or the mouth, whichever hole you're going to go through. And then mark that with some tape so we know if it migrates in or out at all. way you can confirm that once you get the OG placed in is you can put um, like 50 cc's or they say 10 to 5 to 10 cc's of air as you're listening over the stomach. If you hear gurgling then you know you're in the stomach. Um, you may decide to apply some suction to that if you need to decompress that belly. Uh, especially in kids we really need to get those OG tubes in when we've been doing BLS airways because if we inflate the stomach we know they're eventually going to vomit but it also pushes up on the diaphragm, which then restricts some of their breathing. So ventilations can improve if we decompress that stomach. There's some capnography waveforms here. So a normal waveform, that good plateau with that slight little gradual in, um, you know, slope up. Normal end title should be 35 to 45. Remember, if we're bagging too fast, we're going to drive that number down. If we're bagging too slow, that number is going to climb. Okay. Anytime you do an advanced airway, you must confirm with end title. End title should be the first thing that goes on top of your ET tube. Uh, if you're doing CPAP, it's probably the first thing that comes out of your CPAP mask. We want to get the truest reading possible. So if you have to set up filters or inline SVN or any of that stuff, uh, still put the CO2 in line first because we don't want their exhaled air to be scrubbed out through an SVN or a filter before it goes to your monitor. Um, I don't know exactly how it affects it, but I'm sure it's going to give you some false readings. So put it on first. If you have a sudden loss of a waveform, you need to definitely check your tube first. Make sure we don't rip their tube out of place. Okay. Um, second, make sure they didn't just go into sudden cardiac arrest and code on you. Okay. Usually what you'll see if a patient's going to code is they're probably going to be decompensating and that end title is going to be getting lower and lower and lower with poor perfusion and then it's going to go to nothing. All right. As we talked about with um, resuscitation, we want to keep end titles above 10. If they are less than 10, we need to think about swapping our compressor out because it's usually due to fatigue. They're not doing the greatest job anymore. Looking at this one on the right with that cleft, basically if you have to use pharmaceuticals, uh, ketamine, Versed, maybe a Hilo RSI or your agency uses RSI, and you start seeing these little dips in the waveform, what's that mean? It means that they're starting to breathe. They're bucking the tube, okay? Spontaneous respirations. So we need to sedate them like now because we've probably either under sedated them or maybe their paralytic is starting to wear off also um, or we've just gone so long trying to package and load and treat other things that we forgot to resedate. So make sure we're managing that. If we start seeing the shark fin, basically that's going to be for your asthmatics and your COPD patients because they have that prolonged exhalation phase, so we get a bigger slope. Make sure that we're getting our SVNs. Remember, lots of albuterol. We can give Atrovent three times for all patients. Albuterol is continuous, five milligrams, um, and even consider giving Epi. Okay, we can give Epi IM, and then we can also use Epi SVN. With nasal intubation, we got it back in the protocols here. Just make sure that we are putting the spray in their nose so they're not bleeding all over. Uh, remember to use the BAM on the end of that tube. There's a bunch of 12 lead stuff in here if you for if you want to reference it. You know, which leads look at what part of the heart, what vessels. A couple indicators here when you're looking for ST changes, elevations and depressions. Remember to look for those inverted T waves too. That could be a very subtle indication that something's going on. Look for giant Q waves. Q waves with the presence of elevation in the ST segment means that you are actively killing that heart. Okay, that's the big one. This one looks like those tombstone T's. Um, however, if you have a Q wave 
with no ST changes, it's probably an indication of an old MI, and you should ask a few more questions about their history. Here's some good placement for our standard 12 lead, your limb leads. And if you are doing interfacility inter transports, then they talk about IV infusion pumps and how we can transport those medications here. Okay. Um, now with that, that's it. That concludes our training. Uh, please, if you have any kind of questions, uh, comments, uh, this is going to be on the YouTube channel, so you can go ahead and post your comments there. You can always, those of you that know me, can text me, call me, email me, whatever. Uh, if you want any of these resources, the PDF, if you want any kind of um, notes or anything that we've done with our agency, I'd be more than happy to share them with you. Um, you know, knowledge is power and this type of knowledge is meant to be shared because it deals with patients, right? So we want to take care of everybody. Uh, with that, thanks for entertaining me. I uh, hope you learned something and good luck.